Pastor Mitch asked me if I would talk a little bit this morning about my rooted experience. Um, and I just want to say first, I love that he described it like that as an experience. People have had some concerns that it is an in-depth Bible study or a very deep, heavy book study. Um, and I just want to share with you that it is not that at all. It is absolutely an experience. There are two parts about it that I really love. Uh, the first part I would say is the devotions, the daily devotions. They were a wonderful practice to um, spend time reading just a little bit, not too much, and having some questions that um, gave me a chance for self-reflection and digging deeper into my faith and um, maybe things that I didn't know or um, misconceptions that I had. So it was a really wonderful um, time for me. Sometimes my husband and I did those devotions together and sometimes we did them on our own. Um, but I can say that they were um, simplified and very, very powerful. Um, I noticed sometimes that there were just these aha moments where um, I just, I thought I had a view on something and I thought I knew something about God and then I read this and I realize that maybe I didn't have that quite right. Second and really just as impactful as that was the small group experience. Our pilot group, uh, the first group that took it along with Mitch facilitating, was um, the elders and the staff and their spouses if they were able to do that. And we would spend about an hour and a half once a week together. We shared stories about our faith, um, our journeys, where we've been, where we came from. Um, and where we are right now, struggles that we've had, um, triumphs that we've had. And what it did was it really enabled us to get to know each other on a much more personal level. So I can say that we have a wonderful church family. We have so many um, wonderful welcoming people here. And now I can add to that and say that I have a small group um, that I just care so very deeply for and I know that they care the same for me as well. So I would just encourage you Give it a try, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Thank you. Hey you guys, give Marilyn a hand this morning. Yeah. I've been trying I've been trying to get her to come up here and like do the welcome or say something or share a testimony for like a year now. And so but she was able to do that through video. So she did a great, great job. Hey, before I get into today, I, I want to recognize a very special guest uh, to me today. Uh, Glenn Foley is right here and his wife, Judy. Glenn, would you stand up just for a second? And, and Judy, this is, uh, I, I, I mentioned that he might be here last week, uh, but he's down. He's one of my dad's very, very closest friends, and they served together in the church. They led worship together in our home church, and, and so he was just a very special part of our family from Richmond, Kentucky, and so glad that you're here with us. Glenn, Glenn actually, am I, I'm not even on, now I'm on, okay, I, was I on, okay, so Glenn actually was, a, he actually heard my very first sermon when I was 16 years old, almost 40 years ago, it was nine minutes long, it's not going to be that long today, it's going to be much longer than that today. <laughs> Hey, I want to jump in today, and uh, I'm going to reach way back into the archives, way back into the archives to see if you guys happen to know this. Is there anybody here that's familiar with Crockett's Victory Garden? Anybody knew Crockett's Victory Garden? got a couple people, about three or four people. I didn't think there would be Jim Crockett's Victory Garden. Came in like it was 1977, and it was like on a PBS special. And our family watched this like every week religiously. We watched the Crockett's Victory Garden to teach us how to do gardening even better. And so our family was a gardening family. My dad was a gardening nut. I mean, he just really, and we spent a lot of time uh, gardening. I loved it when we gardened with brand new virgin soil where we were just turning the earth for the very first time. You'd put the plow on the back of the tractor and, you know, you'd, you'd till up the, the ground and turn the ground. One of my jobs as a kid was I had to go and remove all the rocks. And I would remove, some of the rocks would be small, some of the rocks would be medium sized, some of the rocks I needed help moving, you know, I couldn't move them on my own. Some of them were huge rocks that you would unearth. And it was fantastic. And we would also, as boys, we would find these uh, Native American 
uh, arrowheads. We used to call them Indian arrowheads. And so uh, Native American arrowheads, we would find those and collect them kind of like here with venison shark's teeth, you know. It was awesome to be able to collect those and find those. But we, my job was to remove the, the, the debris and remove the rocks from the garden, so to speak. And, and, you know, we had to prepare the soil. And it took a lot of work to really get that garden ready, especially for the first time when you're really getting this garden ready. And it, it, it was, it was, you didn't go just to tractor supply and get fertilizer, you know. We, we went and got fertilizer. I mean, we went to horse farms, and we would go, we'd pull our truck up to horse farmers, and my dad would say, you know, he'd say, hey, we'll clean out your horse stall for you if you'll give us the manure. And so then I would be in there, and I'd be shoveling horse manure. And, yeah, I'd just be careful, you know, make sure I didn't let anything slip there. But I'd be shoveling the horse. I always thought that was a really bad deal that we were cleaning out these horse stalls for free, you know, to get this fertilizer. But we'd come back and we'd put that fertilizer down and we would turn that with rototillers and we'd get that going. And man, it was, it was amazing. And because our soil was so fertile, we were able to grow. I mean, it was amazing. We had, we had neighbors come, come to our house just to check out our garden. And we grew some boutique type things that, you know, wasn't normal for Kentucky. We would grow a uh, kohlrabi. That was something that we grew a lot of. It was like a mild turnip. And uh, nobody knew who that was and the, what that was in the 70s or 80s in Kentucky. And we, and we grew asparagus, you know. We had all kinds of things. And it was a fantastic garden. But it all started with the soil. If the soil is not right, you're not going to be able to produce a harvest. And this is what we want to talk about over the next 10 weeks, really, in different ways. We'll talk about getting our soil right in our lives. Getting the soil, making sure that it's fertile soil. This is an illustration that Jesus actually talked about. This is a red letter day where the words that we're talking about today were words that Jesus himself actually spoke. Those are powerful words to me. When it's words that Jesus spoke. And so Jesus tells a lot of stories. People ask me, they say, you know, you know, I'm sort of a storyteller pastor. You say, you tell a lot of stories. Yeah, I tell a lot of stories because I want to be like Jesus. And Jesus told a lot of stories. Jesus was a different kind of a teacher than other teachers. He wasn't like a lot of the other rabbis or the, or the Pharisees. He came in and he told a lot of stories. You know why he told stories? He told stories because people can remember stories. And when you tell stories, and he tells these parables that have this earthly story with a heavenly meaning to it, he would tell these stories because it's a way to take this lofty theology and lofty idea of God and bring it down to a way that you and I can understand it and remember it. And so Jesus told a lot of stories. And so I tell a lot of stories. I, want, I love telling stories. And so Jesus is talking about this, and he tells this story. And this is recorded in Matthew chapter 13. It's also recorded in Luke chapter 8. We're going to look at just Matthew chapter 13 today. But if you want to get the full weight of this, you know, when you go home today, maybe go through and read Luke chapter 8, and you'll see a little bit different angle. And so we, when we talked this fall, we went through investigating Jesus through Luke. We learned that Luke was a historian, and Luke was a medical doctor. He's a little bit more verbose than the other writers. And so he writes in a lot more detail. But Matthew writes in a simpler way for us for today's text that I want to uh, share with us. Before I get to Matthew 13 on the text, though, I want to give you just a little bit of background of what's going on here, where Jesus is at at the time, so you can just kind of put yourself there a little bit. We want to put ourselves there and imagine that we're there with Jesus teaching us and talking to us. Jesus was, his ministry is probably about midway. This is probably about midway, probably about a year and a half into his ministry for his three-year ministry. By this time, he has amassed a lot of followers that have seen his miracles and heard his, the way he teaches. You know, he's not just like the Pharisees and saying you shouldn't do this or do that or don't do this, do that. He's coming in with stories with heavenly meanings and, and, he's, and he's teaching people. People are drawn to that. And so they're drawn to Jesus. He's in the town of Capernaum. Capernaum's a town in the first century. Uh, about 1,500 people or so in Capernaum. And it's right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Or if you read in different accounts, it's also called Lake Gennesaret. But those are the same bodies of water. And he begins to teach in this town. Now, 
Capernaum is a pretty small town, 1,500 people or so. But people were coming from all around the region. There were about 200 towns like that around the, around the region of Capernaum in Galilee. And there were hundreds of thousands of people around that area. And people had heard all the stories about Jesus and the way that he teaches. And so they would come to hear him teach. He was teaching in houses, and then he quickly ran out of room, and they needed a bigger boat, so to speak. And so he, people were sitting on windowsills and just, you know, getting the, the whole room is packed out, even out into the lawns and everything. And so Jesus decided, I need a bigger venue. And so he goes down to the to Sea of Galilee, and there's a region there. You can go there today, um, and you can go, that, that, by the way, that town is called Kefir Nahum now. And you can go there. It's a lot of tourist people go there because Jesus was there in, in Capernaum. But you can go and there's like a natural amphitheater that they think that's where Jesus taught from. And it was like this hillside that kind of concaved down by the water. And large crowd of people. I'm thinking there's thousands and thousands of people that are coming to hear him speak. Because as it talks in scripture, it talks about how he was crowded all the way down to the water. And he had no place else to go. So he steps into a boat and pushes off from shore just a little ways. And then he begins to teach. And he begins to teach in parables. And when he's talking about this, he's saying, first thing he says in Matthew 13, you can see this on the screen. He'll say, hey, listen, listen, you guys, listen to this. Because the crowd was probably all talking, they were excited, they're getting ready to hear Jesus, and he had to quieten them down. You know how it is when there's a big crowd of people and you're trying to gather them together, and Jesus is going, listen, listen, here's the story. There was a farmer, and he went out to plant some seeds. And, you know, he was talking to them, everybody knew about farming, Now I don't know how many of you guys know about farming, you know, but he talked in terms, in ways that everybody culturally would understand. If Jesus was coming here today, he might not use a farming illustration. He might say, hey, those of you pull out your iPhones. You know, he might have been talking about iPhone. Who knows? But in this case, everybody knew how to farm. That was just a common thing, an everyday thing. And he says, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. And as he scattered them across the field, some seed fell on a footpath. And the birds came and ate them. And other seeds then fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun. And since they didn't have deep roots, uh, uh, you see, you see where this is going? Since they didn't have deep roots, they died. And other seeds then fell among the thorns. And some translations in there actually cause that weeds. Some fall among the weeds. And they grew up and choked out the tender plants that were growing. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil. And they produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. And so this is what Jesus begins to share with the people. And basically he tells us, there are four different types of soils, meaning there are four different types of people here. There are four different types of people. And the soil represents us. It represents our heart. It represents our minds. It represents our soul. The seed represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ being sown into you in this case that we're talking about today. You can also use this uh, passage for evangelism. We'll do that another day. But for today, we're talking about us developing good soil in our life. And then he says this. He kind of wraps up with this. He says, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And he shouts this out among the people. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And I think there's a real solid reason why he says that. Because... He explains this now. We jump down to verse 19. And in this, he explains these four types of soils that are representative of four different types of people. And the first one is the hard soil, the hard soil. And here's what Jesus says about the footpath or about the hard soil. He says, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and they don't understand it. 
Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. And that's the first soil, the hard soil. And you know this. If you think about a footpath or one of these hiking trails or hiking paths, you can't just throw some seed on the ground and get that to grow. If it's really dry like it has been and the wind blows, the wind will blow the seed away. If it's really rainy like it was today, it will wash the seeds away. If there's birds that come by, they'll land on the path and they'll eat. You cannot grow on that hard soil, that hard path. I know that firsthand from my house that I have. When I moved into to my house a, year, a little over a year ago, I bought, many of you know Pam Burton, I bought her house. When I bought her house, it was pristine yard. I mean, just the most perfect, beautiful St. Augustine yard. But I brought with me uh, two beasts of burden um, that are my dogs. They are wonderfully uh, burdensome. <laughs> you know, I love them. I love them. I love them. But they have. Uh, they represent Satan, and, <laughs> and they, <laughs> sorry, Michelle. And and they have worn this path in our yard, and they've worn this path down so much. There's no, I cannot get that grass to grow. I have tried everything. Sod, I've raked it up. I can't. These dogs, like, they represent that, you know. So this hard soil. But here's the thing that I want you to understand. I'm probably not talking to anybody. I'm really probably not talking to anybody that has the hard soil. It probably doesn't represent anybody because the reality is the hard soil people, they're not even listening. They don't believe they can't hear the gospel because Satan, the evil one, he has just like one job to do, to steal, to kill. He literally wants to steal joy from you, to kill you, and to destroy you. And the way he destroys people is that he separates them from God. And the way that he separates them from God is that he deafens their ears. Scripture talk about, talks about this. He deafens their ears to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And he blinds our eyes to see the kingdom of God. That's what Satan's responsibility, that's what his job is. That's how he sees his role, is to steal, to kill, to destroy. And so he does that by deafening us. And, and it's like those people are the people with the hard path. So, for instance, if you're telling your story to people, you know, some people are not going to receive the gospel. No matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, I love speaking to groups of people outside the church when I get an opportunity to talk to people like that. But it's like you almost have to say, listen up, open up your ears if you can hear this and understand. Because Satan is working really hard to deafen the ears of the unbelievers. It's a powerful thing. And so we, we want to, that's one of the, that's one of the most difficult areas uh, to have the hard soil. And it's one of the most difficult areas of people to talk to about that. The next soil is the uh, let me just say one other thing about the the hard soil the hard soil people here's here's the way they usually come to christ is there's usually some major crisis that happens in their life some major thing that causes them to realize that i can't do this on my own and i desperately need help and the only help i can think of even turning to is god and so that's the usually those are the only times that people with hard 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 hardened hearts uh, will come to Christ. The next soil is the rocky soil. And it says the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and they immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, get it, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. I think about this. I've got a little spot in the yard where there's just, I don't know what's going on there, but I can't get, the, I, I'm, I'm going to have to dig the whole thing out and put all new soil in there because I can get the grass, it'll grow, it'll come up quick like that, and then as soon as it just gets up, it won't thicken up and it just dies. As soon as the sun comes out, you know, it just dies quickly. That's what it's like when you have rocky soil, when you have so many rocks in your garden, your roots aren't able to go down deep. But, you, but this, may, this may be some of you, you may have experienced this at some point in your life where you go, man, I came and I heard some song or I heard some inspirational speaker or I went to some church camp and I was like on the mountaintop for God. It was like, woohoo, 
Woo, me and Jesus, me and Jesus, we're just like this, you know. And you're so fired up. And then after about three months, you just kind of back where you started again. You just kind of drift away. It's because you didn't have a lifestyle change. It was just an experience. You just had an experience with God, but not a lifestyle change to where you sunk your roots down deep. I see this happen all the time where people will come and, and so, you know, sometimes I just kind of go, man, I hope, I hope they keep that excitement. But they come for two or three weeks and they get so excited and they join the church and they're serving over here. All of a sudden I look up and, you know, a couple months later, I, I don't even, where, where are they at? They left. You know, and they're gone. And, and that happens so often. And unless it becomes a lifestyle change where we are focused on sinking our roots deep down into the living waters of Jesus Christ, we can become, our lives can be representative of and become like that rocky soil. Now, it happens. It happens even in rooted. I've seen this happen with rooted before. People will go, yeah, I gave Rudy a try. I did 10 weeks. It was the best 10 weeks of my life. Man, I was close to God and I was close to others. I was doing this. I was doing that. And I talked to him three months later and I say, how's things going now? And they go, eh, you know, kind of drifted away. Well, are you doing a lot of the things that you cultivated through Rooted? Rooted, rooted is not an end to a means. Rooted is just, rooted is just, we're work. It's a tool to get us to where in, we're in healthy rhythms as a lifestyle. And, and, and so if you're not doing these things that we did during the 10 weeks after Rooted's over, Root is not going to do you anything, you know. It's just an experience that you had, but it's not a lifetime, lifestyle change. So that can happen with Rooted. So the idea of Rooted is not just, okay, great, I did Rooted, now I'm solid, you know. No, the idea is that teaches us. It teaches us the healthy rhythms, which I'll talk about in a minute. It teaches us the healthy rhythms of our life. That we want to continue that on and on. I'll give you a painful illustration. This one is painful for me to say. And it is um, a, a, a level of transparency, which, you know, I, I try to be transparent. But twice in my life, I have lost 50 pounds. And, uh, and I've regained the weight back. And, you know, the first time, I, I know how to lose weight. I know how to do it, you guys you know um and so the first time i lost the 50 pounds you know i i, I got down to 195 and i said you know woohoo let's go get a pizza you know <laughs> and so and then i and then i put the weight back on after i just you know took all that weight off but well then the second time i thought all right i'm not doing that this time i am not going to do that this time i lost the weight again and then i had some knee surgeries and slowly i put the weight back on you know now i know how to do it, but i haven't made a lifestyle change right by the way after this service we're going to be having pizza for our uh, for our rooted uh introduction because i haven't made that lifestyle change yet but we do have salad for you rabbits out there okay so uh yeah who amen salad you can't amen a salad really oh my goodness all right where was that rocky soil uh salad yeah, so, so we want to uh, we want to make sure we want to make sure that we remove the rocks in the garden, and that and I talk about that a lot within rooted. That's one of the things that we do is we are removing the rocks in the garden so that we can have fertile soil. The third soil is the thorny soil or the weeds, and so this is what it says: the seed that fell among the thorns represented those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is being produced. Now, we talked a lot more about this last week where the reasons why people aren't in community and the reasons why that people don't devote themselves to God's word and devote themselves to connecting with others. I mean, I think two of the biggest reasons are busyness. We're just too busy. We are too busy. And if you're too busy for God, you're too busy. If you're too busy to connect with others, too busy. You've got to make a lifestyle change. got to make a lifestyle change on that. If it's a season, I get it. But when the season becomes four seasons, it becomes a lifestyle. So if, if you're not connecting with God, you're not connecting with others, you're just too busy. But the other area, he says, is the lure of wealth. I saw something the other day on Facebook, and it just, I rarely comment 
but on face on stupid things that people say on Facebook. <laughs> but I couldn't pass this one up. The post was, uh, "Money is the root of all evil." If, if money is the root of all evil, why does the church still ask for it? And I, I just couldn't respond. I mean, I couldn't not respond. I had to let them know how terrible that was. Because it's not that money is the root of all evil. That's not the case at all. Jesus never said that. God's word never says that. I, I mean, it's fine. You can have all the money in the world. It's the love of money. It's the love of money. When our priorities become the lure of wealth, that's the issue. That's the issue. And God knows, and God talks about money more than any other topic. Did you know that? He talks about money more than any other topic in the Bible. In fact, there's about 500 verses on prayer. There's about 500 verses on faith. There's over 2,000 verses about money. Here's the reason why. Because God knows, Jesus knows, that money is the number one contender for our heart. Money is the number one contender for our heart. And so God wants us to develop a heart of generosity. When we develop a heart of generosity, and I'm not just trying to get you, hey, develop a heart of generosity so you can give more money to the church. No, I'm not asking you, but we are all supposed to be generous. We're all supposed to be generous. I just think that giving to the church work is one of the greatest places to be generous too. That's just for me in my my life. But this is just something important for us. So as we think about our become, trying to get to this point where we have fertile ground, we have fertile soil, really rich, good soil, we want to get rid of the weeds and the thorns. And so here's what we want to ultimately get to is the fourth soil, the good soil. And Jesus says, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and they produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as has been planted. And so that's what we want to do. We want to lean in to trying to develop the richest, the most fantastic soil that we can have representing our hearts and representing our lives so that we can grow some incredible vegetables and fruits in our life, you know, so that we can produce fruit in our life. The virtues of who Jesus is and how he lived, we want to exhibit that. We want to develop that. Imagine what would happen if every single one of us developed the kind of richness of soil that would allow us to grow roots deep down into the living waters of Jesus Christ. Imagine what kind of a difference our families would be. Imagine what kind of difference our, our lives individually would be. Imagine what our church would look like. And imagine what our entire community would look like. And if, we were, if every single one of us just leaned into God like this. And one of the things that we're trying to do is, is, is launch Rooted. Now, Rooted, there's nothing magical about Rooted. Um, and you, can, there's, you certainly don't have to go through Rooted to develop fertile soil. You know, you, that's, not, that's not, Rooted is just a tool. Rooted is just a plow, right? Rooted is just a plow that we're going to unearth and we're going to clean some rocks out of the garden. We're going to We're going to spend some time with the Lord. And, and so here's, here's what Rooted is. And I just want to kind of explain this. I'm going to do a 30,000-foot view right now. I'll do more of a 5,000-foot view in the cafe after this service. But Rooted does two things. It connects us with each other. We're better together. I talked a whole, spent the whole time talking about that last week. We're better together. We need each other. We can't, we're not designed to just sit in rows. We're designed to be in circles. We're designed to eyeball each other, you know. Let's remember that. So we're designed. We're designed. And it's messy. It's, sometimes it's like shoveling the horse manure, you know. It's like that. You keep waiting for that, right? You know, it's like that. And so, and so we want to, we're desi- and Rooted is designed to connect us to each other. So we're in small groups of people, you know, 8, 10, 12 people. We try not to do more than 12 uh, if we can't help it. Sometimes there's 14. But we try to just kind of get groups of people together. And what we do is... Uh, we meet for 10 weeks. This is actually week number one, so nine weeks after today. And everybody that wants to go through Rooted gets a book. And in this book, it's basically a devotional book. And so five out of the seven days of the week, you, you get this book and you go through the devotional. The way this started, 
first of all, let me back up here and tell you this because I forgot. The way this started was I was asked to speak at a leadership conference in Kenya, in Nairobi, to a church about 7,000 people. And so I flew over there, and when I got there, I realized, my goodness, these are the richest people I've ever seen on the planet. I have never met people with a richer faith than I have. At Nairobi Chapel was the church I was at. Unbelievable. I mean, everybody just had this deepest relationship with Christ in a real way, not a religious way, but in a real life way. And we're connected. And I, and I talked to the pastor, Pastor, pastor Bishop Oscar Murray. You, you guys are going to meet him once this COVID thing and we get to traveling again. You guys will meet him. And, and I asked him, I said, how did you get your people to this point? How did you get there? And he said, well, we were a lot like the American church 20 years ago. And we said, we need to figure out what it looks like to live this gospel message out from, a day, from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. What it means to really be a Christ follower. And so we put together this, this experience. It's not just a Bible study. It's different. It's just kind of like it's an experience of wrestling with God and hearing from God and praying to God. And we called it Mzizi, which is in Swahili means rooted. And so I said, can I get a PDF of this? And he goes, well, actually, I already did that about eight years ago, about five years ago, something like that. He said, I gave a PDF of our work to uh, the, this church in L.A., in Southern California, and Mariner's Church. And so uh, he said, you can call them, and, and they've kind of westernized the material a little bit, so you can kind of understand it more in your culture, and your terms. And so I, I did. I flew back to the States. I called out to Mariner's Church, and they go, ah, it turns out in a couple of weeks we're actually doing a leadership uh, study. There was a small group of us, about 35 people, and I grabbed a couple of people. We flew out to L.A., and I went through this weekend, and I went, it was like this, whoa, this is what we've got to do. You know, it was like, this is what we need to do. And we came back and we introduced it and it was just, it, it just, it just radically changed. Not overnight. It takes a long time. It's two, three years process. That's why I said early on that, you know, we're going to lean into this. This is going to be, a, it's a process because not everybody's going to go through it at, at first. But when you do it, you get your book, you go through the devotional. This will be on your own. This is an example of one day. So you just got like, this is a reading here. This is the reading here. And uh, whoops. And then that's it. A little bit more here. And then you've got a space where you kind of wrestle with God. You answer some questions. And you kind of write this down. And you kind of you write out your prayers. What are you hearing God say to you? How is he speaking to you? And, and how are you interacting? What, what new did you learn from God? You know, you can spend, some people spend 15 minutes, some spend 30. What you end up finding is that the longer that you goes on, you want to spend more time with God. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And so you do this, and then we get together. There's groups that will meet on Monday morning, Monday night, Wednesday morning, Wednesday night. There might be a Thursday. It uh, might be a Saturday. So there's some different times. We'll, 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 we'll tell you about those times in there uh, afterwards. But you have, a choice, you have a chance to come. By the way, Wednesday morning is we are pushing the pause button on Wednesday worship. And we're going to be turning that into Rooted for the next 10 weeks. And so if you come to Wednesday worship already, that's a great place to jump into right there. Because we're going to have different groups. Paul Tucker, Paul Vachon's going to lead. We have a couple other leaders, uh, depending on the number of people that, uh, that are going to be a part of that. So anyway, so that, that devotional is really, really important. And then when you come together, you're discussing... What you're hearing from God. It's not rocket science. You don't have to talk if you don't want to. We sent out a frequently asked questions thing this week. But it gives you an opportunity. gives you an opportunity to begin to process with other people and connect with other people. And it's fantastic. The things that we do in Rooted, we learn seven of the rhythms of Rooted. We learn about daily devotion. What does it mean to do a devotion? Somebody asked me, what is a devotion? A devotion is you're devoting yourself to leaning into God. You're devoting yourself to God's Word. So we learn about daily devotion. We learn about prayer in new kinds of ways. And we're spending time in prayer. And it's awesome. Your prayer life will radically change by the time you're done with Rooted. And then freedom from strongholds. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a rock that you have in your garden. We talk about, we remove rocks in the garden. We talk about sacrificial generosity. All these are part of the seven healthy rhythms. Sacrificial generosity and serving in the community. 
Each rooted group will go out and actually serve uh, somewhere in the community. Maybe it's a nursing home. Maybe it's the fire department. Maybe, you know, it's an elderly person's home. Uh, it w- but there will be opportunities for each rooted group to go out and serve on the weekend. And then you have an opportunity to share your story. And, and sharing your story is as simple as, this is what my life looked like before I met Jesus. This is how I met Jesus. And this is what my life is like now that I've met Jesus. It's not perfect, but I'm growing. And it's real simple. And then the last thing that the healthy rhythm is something that we don't do a lot of. The Jews really did a great job of this in the Old Testament. But it's celebration. We're going to celebrate what God is doing. We don't celebrate often enough. We'll celebrate Super Bowls, but we want to celebrate what God is doing. And so we're going to celebrate God and celebrate the life transformation. And if you were a part of when our elders and when our staff went through Rooted, you saw the celebration Sunday, you'll have an opportunity to do that and we'll all celebrate together. And those of you who didn't get, get, didn't, couldn't go through Rooted right now, you'll celebrate what God has done through their lives. And so it's fantastic. One last thing before we wrap up here is that uh, this is really important too. Is we do a Rooted Covenant and you actually sign this. It's a covenant between you and and the people that you're meeting with, and God. And this covenant basically kind of says that, sort of like, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, that's based on sin, right? Well, this is what happens in Rooted, what's said in Rooted, stays in Rooted. Because we want to create a very safe place for you to be able to come into an environment and be able to rip off your mask Because this is one of the biggest challenges that I've seen in 31 years of ministry is that church people all wear masks. We come in and we think we've got to let people think that we've got it all figured out. That our lives are all rosy and all perfect and all stained glass windows. But that's not the case. And so we don't do ourselves and we don't do the church any good when we try to hide behind the challenges that we have. And so this is a safe place. And we want to commit to that, that what you say in Rooted stays within that group. And no one, no one can take anything that you say outside of that group. Because that causes problems. That's gossip. That's a sin within the church right there. And so we want to create that very, very safe environment. And the other thing in this covenant that we do is that we fight like the Dickens. Is that a term? Like, do you guys, have you heard that term before? Is that not in a long time? That, is that, I don't know if that's... Is that a Kentucky thing, Glenn? I don't know. Florida too? We, we fight like the Dickens um, to keep the unity. To keep the unity of the body through the bond of peace. Paul talks about that. And, and what I mean by that is this is not a space... Because this can happen with small groups. I've seen this. I've seen this and how damaging it can be to churches. This is not a space for group of people to get together. You know? That, oh, I don't like this about the church. No, 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 no. You do that, you know, we, you, we're going to have a meeting. And so you don't want a meeting. And, and so this is a space where we do business with God. And so we focus on that. We are focusing on that. And we fight like crazy to keep the unity of the church through the bond of peace in Jesus Christ. So that's important. So that's what, that's what we're doing. We're going to talk more specifically about how you can actually get involved uh, and, and do that uh, right after this, right after we're done here. We're just going to kind of move, give an opportunity for you guys who can't do Rooted to, to take off. Um, and you'll be ostracized for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I, actually, I'm really kidding about that. I, I don't want you to feel that way at all. Because I get it. There's seasons and times where we just can't, you know, we can't be involved in something like that. But I want to close out with this here. Um, you may have noticed this pot up here. <laughs> I don't know if you can say pot. I should say planter. Um, <laughs> I have this planter up here. And this planter is, it is filled with, well, I'm going to call it um, supernatural dirt. It's a supernatural dirt. And this fertile soil here, uh, this fertile soil is going to represent, um, this is going to represent our journey over the next 10 weeks with Rooted. And I, and I think it'll be amazing because this soil is 
supernatural. I'm going to take these seeds here. I've got these seeds, and I'm going to plant these seeds in this dirt. And sort of symbolically, we're going to pray, and we're going to see here, we're going to see what God does next week when you come. And, and, and I think it's going to be amazing that we'll see what actually begins to grow out of this pot, out of this planter through the next 10 weeks or so. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, how deep we can get our roots. And so I hope that you come back next week and, and, and journey with us. And we're going to be talking very basic next week on who is God. That's a lofty question right there. But who is God? And we're going to be addressing that and talking about that. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Give an opportunity for those of you who need to, to jet and take off. Uh, give you an opportunity to take off. The rest of you guys who are staying, we'll go out in the cafe and have some pizza. Because I haven't made a lifestyle change yet. Father, thanks for our family. Thanks for your son, Jesus. And it's all because of him that we come together and that we are, it is our greatest desire that we begin to look and think and feel and live more like you with all of your virtues, with kindness and gentleness and generosity, humility. God, rid us of pride. Let us come before you and take off whatever mask that we have that we kind of feel like we've got to have everything all right and all perfect but that we come before you just as we are and you don't leave us that way you begin to change us and transform us into who you want us to be and that's our prayer for our church as we lean into you in Jesus name Amen